Okay, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Li Ding Yao. I am a fourth year graduate student in UW Medicines. Uh, I'm working with uh, Blind Street and doing some uh, harmonic analysis problem with backgrounds in differential geometries and cell conference variable and series of function space. So today I'm going to talk about uh, my thesis, which is uh, some estimate of some so-called non-smooth uh, complex for being structures. Yeah, it does have some backgrounds in differential geometry, but maybe let me start with um, some analysis stuff. So let's talk about some first order linear PD systems. Um, here I'm going to denote this Li as a first order uh, partial differential operators. So you can think about this one as a rectifuse fuse and uh, with coefficients Aij. Now let's think of this one as a smooth in the beginning. So we are going to talk about the solutions to this equation system. Suppose we have some kind of uh, F1 up to FR and it, cert uh, it satisfies certain uh, compatible conditions. So we want to find out whether this is a solution U that satisfies this equation system. So by compatible conditions, for example, one can think about uh, just the ordinary the gradient of this equations. So in this case, because we know that the uh, second order derivatives is always communities. So necessarily we should have this uh, partial IFJ equals partial JFI. So this one is one of the compatible condition to that. Okay. And then uh, to make life simpler, we are going to assume that this uh, vector fields L1 up to LR are always linear independent. And now, so our goal is to think about, to study, this kind of uh, equation system to think about whether it's solvable in certain conditions and solvable what is uh, the behavior of the solutions. Yeah, so now we have this kind of L1 up to LR. Uh, if we just think about zero solutions, in this case, we don't need to worry about the compatible conditions. And in this, in this settings, we can realize that it doesn't matter for what the L1 up to LR we chose. But actually, we need to look for the span of this L1 to LR. And now I'm going to introduce a, a complex subbundle, we we'll call it S. This one is a rank R subbundles in RM. And each point is it is the span of some complex vector space given by the L1 up to LR evaluated on the point P. Okay. So now uh, we in this settings, we don't really really need to worry about what's the coefficients of this L1 up to LR now. All we need to know is we need to know the structures of the S. So we kind of like a transform the problems into this to, the, to study the geometry structures of this S. And yeah, let me introduce another notions for this kind of subbundles. And uh, in the study of uh, such kind of uh, uh, systems, we will also introduce something called involutivity. And the subbundle is called involutive. If uh, whenever you have two vector fields, there are the sections of this S, then the commutators is also a section of S. So the commutators, you can think about this one as uh, the second order differential operator x y minus y x, and then the second order coefficient will just go uh, goes to zero, and there's only first order one. So that's why the commutator it's also a vector field. So once we have the involutivity on this S. If S is spanned by some kind of L1 to LR, then we will have the so-called structural coefficient equations. We can find some uh, Cijk that such that this equation is satisfied. Now, if we want to go back to the original systems, LU equals to F, then in order to make this equation solvable, then necessarily we will have this equations, which is the Li, uh, sorry, Ljfi minus Lifj is going to be a linear combination of some Fk. So yeah, now we have the necessary conditions and people naturally will ask, um, when is the necessary condition be sufficient? So when is this condition be sufficient? So to answer that, I am going to give you a example where this thing is not sufficient. So, but to before that, let me go to make things simpler. Let me give you an example, which is non involutive So a, let me think, of, uh, let's think about in R3, we have a rank two real subbundle spanned by this L1 and L2. Okay, so if you compute the commutators of L1 and L2, it will give you, give you uh, two d by dt. And then this two d by dt, it's actually linear independent with L1 and L2 at every point. So 
now we have it. Uh, we we will have this pictures, uh, which is the uh, rank two subbundle, and it will have some kind of real behaviors. So uh, using this non-involuntary examples, let we construct a rank one complex subbundle. So it's rank one, and it's only spanned by a complex vector field L, which is actually the L one plus uh, I L two uh, or divided by two. Okay. And for this kind of uh, L here, he, he proved that uh, if we consider the uh, equations, you don't, it's not an equation system at this moment. Now it's think about uh, L u equals to F, then at every point, uh, we can find some functions F such that in a neighborhood of that points, there's no solution of U. So this one, uh, it's not locally solvable if we chose this such kind of L. And there's actually a whole bunch of complex theories towards that. And uh, it, uh, it's, there is a series to study this kind of involved structures and it will talk about some kind of uh, non-trivial local cohomologies. Yeah, but in our cases, everything is good. Uh, I'm going to show you two examples where uh, those necessary, uh, this necessary condition is also sufficient. Okay. So let's start with the real cases where all the vector fields are the real vector fields. In this case, we can consider a real subbundle, and I'm going to denote it as V. So a V at every point is going to be the real spans of this L1 to LR. Now, if V is a involutive subbundle, then we have a theorem, which is the classical for binning theorems. It says that if we have a, such kind of V, then locally we can always find able to find a smooth parameterization, such that V is the push forwards of this uh, some several real vector fields under the phi. Okay. So now in these settings, if we want to talk about just want to we'll talk about the general solutions of L equals zero, then uh, we will see that by composing with phi, then u phi is just a function of the, the last n minus r variables. And then the first r many variables, it's a uh, constant along those sides. Okay. Now, um, in our settings, I'm going to denote that the t to be the first r variables and s to be the n minus, last n minus r variable. In this case, is, we can say that v is the span by d by dt. So if you want to care about the regularity estimates, then if uh, we is CK or CK alpha, we are actually able to find out some phi such that phi and dv dt are also CK or CK alpha. And this is because uh, the, we have all the regularity estimate toward that. So if we have a vector field which is CK, then the OD flow is also CK. And so it's the same as the CK alpha. And yeah, and then just as, as a digressions, Recently, I have a paper to talk about this kind of forbidden theorems, but in the settings that where we is only log niches. Yeah, so there's a lot of things going on on, define, on how to define this involutivity and uh, what does it mean by having a parameterization, which is not going to be C1 anymore. Yeah. yeah, so this one is just a digressions. Now, um, we want to try to reformulate this real forbidden theorems in order to satisfy our need. So here uh, I'm going to use a notion called essentially real. It's a complex subbundle such that it equals to its complex conjugate. And now we see that we can see that this essentially real complex subbundle are one one corresponding to the real subbundle in the sense that if you have a V, then you take a complexifier, you get the S. And if you have an S, then you take the intersection of uh, the tangent bundle, you get the V. And this settings we can restate the real for being theorems by saying that. If we have an essentially real subbundle, which is involutive, then we can find some coordinate, uh, we can find some parameterization such that S is the span of the push forward of several real vector fields. Okay. Now here is the first case. And then the previous one is real in the sense that S equals S bar. Now let's consider the another extreme. This one's uh, com purely complex. In this case, uh, S and S bar will have uh, zero intersections. And if we take that sum, it will span the whole space. And in this case, we call the S a almost complex structures. Yeah, so if you remember the class in differential geometry, uh, you might see that P 
people usually you refer a almost common structure as a section of an anamorphism J such that the J square equals a negative identity. But in indeed, um, that such J and S is also one of correspondence. Uh, in the sense that if we have a J, then we can take the eigenbundle, either the eigenvalue I or eigenvalue next I, then we produce a S. And conversely, if S satisfy the S direct sum of S bar equals to CTM, then we have this guy means that we have a projections. So a W can be written as the WS and WS bar. Now the J is defined to be, we multiply I in WS and we multiply I in WS bar and we sum them together. Okay. okay. And then one can also check that when we talk about the almost common structure J, we have integral conditions, uh, which is defined to be the vanishings of the Nigel House tensor. And then uh, there's a couple of work to check, but it's not very difficult that this one, the vanishings of N J is the same as saying that the subbundle S is uh, involutive. It's closed under the Lie brackets. Okay. Yeah, now we are kind of transform the settings of almost complex structures. And then the corresponding, the span of the vector fields results is so-called the Nunander Nuremberg fields. It says that if we have such kind of a almost complex structure that satisfies involutivity, then we can locally we can find a parameterizations. It, it, it's now defined on the complex space, such that the S is the span of some uh, complex vector field divided Z. Okay. So now if we go back to the origin, if we want to talk about uh, in this settings, what's the solution to LU equals zero, then the result is that now U of phi is going to be an anti holomorphic function. So, so to study the zero solution is, to same, uh, is the same as to study the uh, properties of holomorphic functions. Okay. And then if we take the complex conjugate, we can see that the S bar is going to be the span of D by DZ bar. So if we want to talk about the regularity estimate, uh, the McGrange has an important paper that shows that uh, in C, when S is CK alpha, then we are able to find a coordinate, which is CK plus one alpha. So in particular, the coordinate vector fields is going to be CK alpha. So this estimate is actually sharp. And then uh, when we try to adapt it into the CK settings, uh, the regularity estimate will fail. So I will have examples, which is CK to subbundle CK, but we cannot find the CK plus one coordinate. And the reason it's kind of simple, it's because when we talk about Laplace equations, it will not gain two derivatives in CK space. So I will actually sort of go back to talk about this one in the end. Yeah, so we sort of want to uh, sum up these two results. We want to try to combine these things. That's what the complex forbidden theorems try to do. So in the real forbidden theorems, the S is the span of some real vector fields d by dt. And then in the complex, uh, in the Nunander Nuremberg theorems, the S is the span of some uh, purely complex vector fields. So we want to find out a necessary conditions for S such that locally we are able to find a uh, parameterization phi such that S is going to be the span of some real and some complex vector fields. Okay. So to find a necessary condition, we can just assume that the S is just the span of d by dt and d by dz. So now, uh, first, you can see that if we take the complex conjugate, the S bar is going to be the span of d by dt and d by dz bar. So uh, yeah, we can also produce two different subbundles. The S intersect S bar, which is the span of d by dt, and the S plus S bar, which is going to be the span of d by dt, d by dz, and d by dz bar. So if you compute the commutators of the coordinate vector fields, you will see that they will always be zero. So that's why now the three bundle should be all involutive because they are both, uh, they are all the span of uh, coordinate vector fields. Yeah, and then, but there is one condition which is uh, verbatim. So the involutivity of S in the S bar can be directly implies by the involutivity of S. And this is the, uh, the reasons why we have that. Yeah, now we, so now we have a necessary conditions and uh, this one is so-called the complex for being structures. And S is called the complex for being structures if uh, S and S plus S bar are two subbundles that are both involutivity, that both satisfy the involutivity. 
So S plus S bar is gonna be a complex of bundles and it's uh, also be informative. Then now we can talk about the, the complex forbidden theorems. So if S is a complex forbidden structures, then locally we are able to find out a uh, parameterization, which is defined on some uh, real space at prod that with the complex space, such that S is the span of the push forward of some real vector fields and some complex vector fields. Okay. And this is the theorem that we, uh, that we uh, want to talk about today. So yeah, there are some uh, kind of uh, estimate of the uh, uh, regularity estimates of the complex theorems. So the study of the, non, uh, the study to talk about this non-smooth settings uh, is begin with Nigel House Wolf, where they are actually caring about the parameter dependence of the Lunet and Nuremberg theorems. So if you have uh, some, if you have some almost complex structure, then each structure is, you produce a coordinate chart. And now you sort of want to talk about what's the dependence. Can we try to find out some kind of families of uh, coordinate structures? That depend that has a smooth dependence on the parameters. Okay, and so this one is just a special cases of a complex structures, and then yeah, there are some discussions about the estimate of complex structures. So Hugh and Taylor's uh, they managed to lower the regularity assumptions where S is only C11, and then uh, a professor Xiang Honggong he has a paper to talk about the whole estimates. And then he is able to find out coordinate charts, which is CK alpha minus. So, and in this statement here, it's actually M one sharp. And then if we want to care about some spe estimate of special cases, there are some uh, sharp results. So previously, uh, I will talk about the McGrangers uh, estimate, which give the sharp results for the new and the theorems. And then my advisor, Brian Street, recently generalized this settings uh, when, it does not require the S intercept as far as equal to zero. It's called the elliptic structure. Yeah, and he also uh, be able to get the sharp estimate. Okay, so now I can talk about my results. So uh, my result is that uh, if we have a complex for being structures, which is CK alpha for some case bigger than one and some alpha between zero and one, then locally we are able to find out uh, some coordinate charts such that the S is the span of those real vector fields and those complex vector fields. And such that, so the coordinate chart is going to be CK alpha. And then the coordinate vector fields is going to be CK alpha minus. So for CK alpha minus, we means that this one is going to be CK alpha minus epsilon for all epsilon greater than zero. And then this two results, uh, the phi is in CK alpha and DVDZ is in CK alpha minus, they're actually both sharp. So the, so the sharpness of phi is no surprising because in real Fubini theorems, uh, we, the best irregularity as we can get is just the phi is in CK alpha. Okay. But then the part of the DVDZ bar is in CK alpha minus, it's a little bit unexpected because in real Fubini theorems, the D by DT parts are going to be CK alpha. And the Newland and Nuremberg theorems, the D by DZ part is also CK alpha. Okay, so in here, we will inevitably lose some kind of derivative. And then, so let me try to explain why are we act, uh, why this loss, regularity loss, is inevitable. So, yeah, if we're going to talk about the Laplace equations, yeah, we know that it will gain two derivatives in subject space and holder space. And it fails to gain two derivatives if we want to talk about. Uh, L infinity type space or CK space. So if we want to talk about this Laplace equation with parameters, say if we want to get a S here, so what is the correct space that we want to say in order to say that you gain two derivatives on T? Okay, so a good way to think about that is, okay, so we uh, think about all kinds of solutions U, and then uh, we want to take the two derivative along T regular. So if we, you do gain two derivatives on T, then after we take the two derivatives, then you should, this, uh, this second order derivative should lay in the same space of, S, uh, of this F. Okay, and now if we try to rewrite this, uh, the gradient, uh, second gradient of U into some expression of F, 
we can see that this one is just the, uh, the Rich transform X on F twice, whether this Rich transform, it's a Rich transform that only acts on T variable, okay? And so formally, if you think about one dimension, the Rich transform is just the Hilbert transform along, just along T variable. Okay. Yeah, so um, now here's the things. If we consider the holder space along both variable, then if this, if we consider this uh, T variable risk transform, it's not going to be bound in CK alpha. And this observation, uh, if we try to sort of explain a little bit in detail, this is because when we have a CK alpha space, it, it can be you can have a biparameter bi decompositions. So uh, we uh, we fix S, we take the CK alpha norms on T, and then we take a super on S, and then uh, similarly, we fix T and then we take the CK alpha norm on S, then we take a super on T. Once we do this process, we can recover the CK alpha norm on the total space. Now, if we look at the first part of the space, this is actually a good one because uh, in T variable, it's gonna be CK alpha. So uh, R is gonna be CK alpha on this space. So R is actually bound in this space. But for the second one, it's really bad because re transform, we know it fails to have boundedness in our infinity space. So in fact, uh, R is not gonna be bounded in this space. And then by, think, by doing some uh, sophisticated constructions, we can actually show that, yeah, we can actually find some F such that the RF is not gonna lace inside CK alpha. Okay, and that's the reasons, uh, one simple reason why we uh, would inevitably lose some derivative on the B by the Z parts. Okay, yeah, so, uh, for time constraint, that's all I want to talk about. And thank you for listening.